Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here Friday now, the 17th day of November 2023. On the update today, as the headline there said, the thumbnail, let's take me away for a second. What was that? We're going to talk about that. That was yesterday morning. I'm going to do my best to explain it to you. A lot of questions about it. Why wasn't it named? What exactly was it? But we certainly know there were impacts from West Palm Beach all the way down to the Keys, some significant impacts resembling that of what we would see during a truly tropical event, like a named storm. But whatever that was, just goes to show once again that you don't have to have a name. It doesn't need to be vents. It doesn't need to be a hurricane or what have you to have pronounced and very um, impactful impacts. All right, so let's get on with it. I'll show you what we got. First, let's talk about going back in time a little bit. The setup for it this is from my friend Taylor here. Model guidance, this is from the 14th, suggesting that the southeast coast of Florida, including the I-95 corridor, is in store for a significant rainfall event. Much of this event hinges on where the axis of heaviest rainfall sets up. We know now where it was, but big impacts are certainly possible Wednesday. And if we scroll up in time or get closer to the present, model guidance, this was from the 15th, wasn't encouraging, as he said, looking like a very big rain event for South Florida. So this was well telegraphed, and you know that's all well and good, but like, what exactly was it? Well, we'll get into that as we move forward. Finally, on the 15th, things really started to blossom. We had incredible rain rates, as Taylor says here, with embedded supercells. Yes, supercell thunderstorms, rotating thunderstorms, coming off the Florida Straits and the vicinity down there, moving onshore into the I-95 corridor this afternoon. Of course, that was the 15th. And uh, the training and back building did occur, and the coastal convergence did happen, and southeast Florida was nailed, and it just kept going and going and going. You guys remember all these loops, and then finally... Early yesterday morning into the wee hours, right near daybreak, this gym popped up, and everybody's like, what in the world? I mean, it literally looks like a small hurricane or a tropical cyclone, but it wasn't, all right? So I'll leave you in suspense a little bit longer. Here's a tweet here from Philippe. This uh, is quite the radar animation for South Florida and the Keys. Multiple low-top supercells merging into a formative, and then there's the key right there. This is what I wanted to show you. MCV. No, it's not MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's the MCV, Mesoscale Convective Vortex. Um, quite different from the MCU, by the way. North of Marathon Key, vorticity galore. Very fancy word for lots of spin, just so much spinning going on down there. All right, so what is an MCV, the Mesoscale Convective Vortex? We'll get to that, I promise. Uh, and then other tweets that uh, Philippe had here. Philippe, of course, works at the National Hurricane Center, which, of course, is located down there in the Miami area. So, yeah, a lot of people were impacted by it. So let's go over to the AMS, the American Meteorological Society, and their handy-dandy glossary of meteorology an MCV, or Mesoscale Convective Vortex, mid-level, warm core, that's important. It's important because it was similar to a tropical system, and warm core gets its energy from latent heat release from the warm water, generally, right? So a warm core low-pressure system that develops within the stratiform region of a Mesoscale Convective system. So just a larger overall weather pattern that the MCV forms inside of as the result of latent heat, that's the thunderstorms and the convection, releases that relatent heat, relatent, releases the latent heat over a multi-hour time period. That's what we saw. The cyclonic vortex, and that's what uh, my thumbnail was made up. There's your vortex right there. And then some of these tweets here from Philippe and uh, Taylor you can see that cyclonic vortex, the MCV, coming together yesterday morning. Um, they're very small, 31 to 124 miles. I think that's interesting how precise they are with it. You know, what if it's 30 or what if it's 125? Then what is it? Anyway, 
in a depth, and we're just looking at miles here to help you know all of us that are not um, metrically oriented, one and a half to three miles thick, right, a depth. So it's not this huge stacked tropical cyclone. It's a little shallower of a system, and it can persist for about 12 hours or more until um, after the MCS, the uh, mesoscale convective system, just the larger parent uh, feature that caused it, has dissipated. Now, this is interesting. A residual mesoscale convective vortex may help initiate a subsequent episode of convection. And, of course, convection is thunderstorm activity. But this is also really interesting right here, and why a lot of people were like, hey, what is that? It should be named. Yes, sometimes these MCVs, these convective vortexes, can move into tropical waters and serve as the nucleus, the genesis, the seedling, for a tropical cyclone. We have seen that time and again. I think Arthur in 2014 formed from an MCV that came off the southeast United States, got over the very warm waters of the southwest Atlantic, and it became a Category 1-2 hurricane. I was in the eye of that over the Oregon Inlet along the Outer Banks of North Carolina. That started as a little MCV, a mesoscale, so it's smaller, right? Uh, it's not a big, large system on a big synoptic scale. It's a smaller scale. And so, yeah, sometimes they can, these can serve as our seedlings for tropical cyclones. So it certainly looked like one was trying to form from these radar images here, a lot of this from radar scope, of course, but it was not a tropical cyclone. Here's just another one, and I'll put links to these if you guys want to read these. Um, this is more in depth over from Colorado State University. I'm not going to try to dissect this one for you, but I want to show you this is out there if you want to read more about it. All right? Um, knowing is half the battle. Was that G.I. Joe that said that or something? Anyway, superhero day here. MCU and MCVs and G.I. Joe. This is what it looked like from our Nest Cam hosted by our friend Craig Setzer in Fort Lauderdale. That thing looks like a monster supercell wedge tornado, doesn't it? Luckily, it wasn't. I mean, it was like, really, the animation of this, this time lapse, really did look Hollywood-esque there at the very beginning. Let's go back and rewind it. Look at that. You can see some Mamatis in there, and that's right off the shores there of Fort Lauderdale. There's the Atlantic Ocean right there, and that's the system leaving this small scale you know, because it's not a big hurricane or a giant nor'easter, so it's mesoscale, uh, moving away, and then we had a brilliant day with a lot of moisture in the air yesterday. But that's what I wanted to show you, and I'll put links again to these right here if you want to read more about what was that yesterday morning. It was a mesoscale convective vortex that brought a lot of unpleasantries for our friends and to our friends down there in south and southeast Florida. And then the day got pretty good and everybody got a chance to dry out. What about today? Well, there's nothing on the map today because the whole system that did spawn a tropical weather outlook is it's no longer. It's not even um, a thing, as they say. And neither really is going to be 98L. It had a chance. The models were kind of pro-development. Now they've backed off. I mean, climatology at some point has to kick in you know, the fact that we're in November here, getting towards the latter part of November. We're over the top. Now we're going down the other side. November is going to come to an end in less than two weeks. And the El Nino, which is very strong, all that's just going to go against something really trying to get together and consolidate into a tropical cyclone in the Caribbean Sea this time of year. It's just really hard to do. But there is still some energy down there. And that energy vorticity, whatever you want to call it, thunderstorms, is manifesting itself in the form of some heavy rain for Jamaica, the Haitian Peninsula over here, eastern Cuba, and parts of the southeastern Bahamas. So yes, there are impacts, and I think I am going to do it for next hurricane season. Seriously, we're going to have a line of t-shirts that comes out, a product line, rain is an impact. And everybody can be like, what, is it, what does that mean if you get one of those shirts? So it's, a, it's an awareness thing. Rain is absolutely a big impact. Flooding causes so much misery and pain and death around the globe every year. And a lot of people just kind of dismiss it because rain 
is just not thought of as being problematic. It's so helpful, usually, but as we saw in Southeast Florida just recently, another stark reminder, rain is an impact. All right, drill that into your heads, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll have t-shirts to help you with that next year. It is, it's gonna happen. All right, um, so the week ahead, leaving the tropics for now, and maybe for good until next year anyway, and we'll talk about tropical stuff each Monday on my weekly update, but I want to look ahead to the travel week coming up. Thanksgiving uh, is upon us in less than a week now. A lot of people are going to be traveling, and there was the look in the modeling that there could be a pretty significant storm. I was even starting to make plans to go up to the Great Lakes and cover potentially a big lake effect event, but today, like when we see a hurricane coming, like the 12Z guidance, it's like, what? What event? And I'm going to show you the current GFS. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, other things here, a tweet that I want to show you, a series of tweets. And, and yes, I know it's called something else, but it'll always be Twitter to me. And then a very interesting text product. It's right over there, that tab right there. You'll see in a minute an area forecast discussion from National Weather Service Buffalo that'll be interesting to see how it changes based on today's model guidance. So what do we got? Well, here's the current setup. And uh, there's our leftover low pressure area that was at once that MCV down there. And not gonna amount to much, it's gonna move on up into the Atlantic, scoot on out to sea, and that will be that. A Little bit of a shortwave trough moving in over here. And you can see the thicknesses are lowering. So a little bit colder air coming into Southeast Canada and the extreme Northeast US. Meanwhile, out in the west, a persistent storm system offshore hasn't really crashed ashore with much fanfare, but some precipitation out west. Low elevation rain, high elevation snow, and some of that snow could be heavy. But what about next week? All right, so we get this mid-latitude storm that tries to get going, but it doesn't seem to have the energy that it had in earlier runs. And let me just show you. Let's just go back to 24 hours ago, and I'll show you. See, yesterday it looked like, whoa, look at that, pretty big storm cutting in through the nation's midsection, up through the Great Lakes, leaving a favorable pattern for all kinds of lake effect shenanigans late next week, mid to late next week. But, and I mean, even the overnight run last night, look at that, that was like, wow, and you could serious lake effect plumes coming off there. I was texting a few of my colleagues like, oh, here we go. And then at 12Z today, it's like, wait a minute, Never mind. See, the storm system comes and goes, and it's barely even noticeable. And uh, yet, yet, you have snow in the high elevations, higher elevations down in Mexico. <laughs> what is that all about? So interesting times coming up. Um, you know, it'll be wet if you're traveling, but it doesn't look as stormy. Or, since this is still almost a week away, is it like we see with hurricanes coming? And it's like, oh, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to hit or whatever. And then people kind of back away and they don't worry about it. And all of a sudden, it's back. We don't know because this is still several days away. So what I thought would be a pretty easy Friday update, oh, big storm coming next week. We all got to watch it a little bit up in the air now. You know, the 12 Z Euro, not quite out yet. So I don't want to wait for it. I want to get this video on for you. But we'll see. And then the ensembles, just like with hurricane forecasting, what do the ensemble say? Glad you asked. All right, rhetorical question there. Let's head over to Twitter, as I will always call it. And um, I don't know who Nick is. I just saw this tweet under the for you part. That's one good thing about Twitter, I think, at least for me. So he's a meteorologist, seems trustworthy enough. University of Albany Center of Excellence, so forth and so on. Hey, affiliated with the Mesonet, the New York Mesonet. Those are cool. Those are very important, those Mesonets. So anyway, somebody reliable, right, knows what they're talking about. So this is interesting. Just an hour ago, far from certain yet, but it seems increasingly likely that the Northeast will avoid a big storm. The trend in the deterministic, that's important there. It's not the ensembles, but the deterministic GFS highlights this. Incidentally, this is one of the most massive differences, and I agree, that I can recall in a five-day forecast. Let's discuss why this happened below. And this GIF animation that he's put together highlights what I just showed you. The differences over the last several days, we went from, whoa, to, eh. So we shall see. And um, maybe I'll put a link to this as well, this whole thread. 
from Nick and then Kalen, who I've referenced multiple times over the years. The GEFS versus the GFS, so that's your ensemble versus the operational for the following air mass shows a stark difference in timing and location under a week out. And just to show you, the ensemble is much colder than the deterministic. You understand? So there is still some uncertainty. And then finally, South Carolina weather. Yeah, people watch this everywhere. The weather, it's important. It affects us all. Uh, Mitch West, last four ones of the GFS. GFS basically throws a wrench into there being a cold Thanksgiving. If this flip and guidance ends up happening, then man, what a crap show by model guidance. It's true. It did. It looked like it was going to get cold for Thanksgiving, and it still might, but it's very interesting. And it's also, I think, interesting how this is analogous to what we deal with when we are trying to forecast and understand hurricanes. So here's the forecast discussion out of Buffalo. Um, and I think this was updated this morning, so it's not that old. But looking at their long-term part, these fair paragraphs right here, it's going to be really interesting to see how this changes this afternoon. They're talking about the setup, still remaining breezy Wednesday with cold air, etc. Then they talk about the climatological perspective of a big lake effect snow event and how everything should come together and so forth. But then they say still many details to iron out in the next few days as far as band placement and intensity, so forth. I mean, it may not even happen at all if the 12Z deterministic GFS comes to pass. Or areas from Buffalo towards Watertown, you know, the usual areas up there, you could be in for quite an event. Stay tuned. It looks like I will, and I'd be back Monday anyway, because we do these on Monday regardless. But we'll have something to talk about Monday. Either it's going to happen, and oh, here we go, or eh, enjoy your mild Thanksgiving, uh, relatively speaking, uh, the jury's still out quite a bit as the models are, it's just weird, like, what happened? Same thing with hurricanes. You never know, right? So there you go. Uh, I thought I was going to have an easy one for you to say, get ready. Instead, it leaves us with a cliffhanger that I'll invite you to make sure you tune in on Monday, all right? And, yeah, we will go over tropical stuff on Monday. We always do that, take a look at where things are, what some of the models are saying. A few things related to the upcoming hurricane season, 2024, even though we're still in November, yes, we do start to look ahead. It gives us something to do. And then we will look at lower 48 weather, and we'll see what happens or not with our potential big East Coast event, lake effect, whatever. All right? Between now and Monday, have a great weekend ahead from all of us at Hurricane Track. I'm Mark Sutta, thanking you for tuning in. We'll do it again Monday.